Welcome back to the Packet Lab. Today we're going to take a look at configuring Secure Shell SSH on Cisco devices. And as always, we should start out by defining what Secure Shell is, uh, SSH. Secure Shell or SSH, and that's what I'm going to refer to it going forward as SSH, and that's what you're going to hear it referred to as probably about 95% of the time this comes up in conversation. It's a network protocol that allows data to be exchanged using a secure channel between two network devices. And the key word in that sentence is secure. SSH was designed as a replacement for Telnet and other insecure remote shells which send information, notably passwords, in plain text rendering them susceptible to packet analysis. So basically SSH is your secure version of Telnet, although it's not Telnet, it's a separate protocol, but it's your secure choice over Telnet. And I have a series of videos that compare and contrast Telnet and SSH. I think they're called Telnet versus SSH. Anyways, I'll put a link in the show notes for that lesson and that'll go into a whole lot more detail. But basically, Telnet says sends everything in clear text. So what happens is that you create this Cisco security policy and you set up your usernames, you set up access levels for them, you know, you go through all this legwork and it all gets shot to shit because what's happening if you're using Telnet is that your username and passwords are being sent over the wire in clear text and it doesn't take a genius hacker to sniff that wire pick those up decrypt that and again take a look at those videos if you want more information that it'll go and get like actual packet captures and compare and contrast ssh with telnet so as you can see ssh is pretty important cisco and well for what it's worth i both strongly recommend that you use SSH instead of Telnet in your network. SSH uses the common client server model and it's going to use public key cryptography to authenticate the remote computer which is the SSH server and what we're looking at today is we're looking at how to configure the server portion of this on Cisco devices by default on Cisco devices the client portion runs without any configuration and these other bullets here kind of do a compare and contrast between Telnet and SSH. So SSH is going to use TCP port 22. Telnet uses TCP port 23. SSH was first developed in 1995, so it's a bit long in the tooth. It's about 15 years old. But compared to Telnet, it's a baby because Telnet was developed in 1969, so it's over 40 years old. There's two versions, 1.0, which is usually shown as SSH-1, so SSH-1, and version 2.0, which is SSH-2. They are actually incompatible with each other, and we'll take a look at this in a little more detail later on in this lesson. It does note here that with the two versions of SSH, Cisco routers running newer code uh, 1234T and later, which nowadays really isn't too new, but anywho, just know that anything that's older than that is only going to support SSH1, so that's important to keep in mind. As I had mentioned, SSH uses the common client server model, and the server bit is what we will be configuring. The integrated client is running without any configuration necessary. So this is the connection that provides a functionality that's similar to an inbound Telnet connection. Again, whenever I think of SSH, it's basically Telnet with encryption. And then the integrated client is the portion that runs on the router so if you're connecting from a router to another router that first router let's call it R1 will be the client and it will initiate the connection to the second router which is R2 which will be running the SSH server that's usually a daemon I suppose that would work as a daemon in Cisco too because it's kind of a Unix code base but anyways I'm not going to get into all that uh, just know that you connect from the client to the server and the client enables a Cisco router to make a secure encrypted connection to another Cisco router or any other device running the SSH server this connection provides functionality that is similar to an outbound telnet connection except that the connection is encrypted so once again when you think of SSH think of telnet but with encryption. And the last bit down here talks about the ciphers that it supports, which are DES, triple DES, and password authentication. This is kind of important. Actually, this is very important uh, if you're used to using Telnet. The user authentication mechanisms supported for SSH are RADIUS, TACX, and the use of locally stored usernames and passwords. And at first blush, that looks like, okay, well, it's the same thing as Telnet. What's conspicuously missing from that is that you cannot use the VTY line password with Telnet, you might be used to setting up your VTY lines and just putting a password there and then the user's Telnet in and can use that. In this case, you need to use locally stored usernames and passwords, you know, the local database, or push this authentication out to TACX or RadiusBox. You're not going to be able to just configure the password underneath the 
VTY line, and we'll see this in action later. So why should we use SSH? Well, in a word, security. SSH is encrypted. The communication is encrypted, whereas Telnet is not it's sent in plain text. So it's preferable to use SSH over Telnet whenever possible simply because it's more secure. Telnet's going to send everything out in plain text, and as I mentioned earlier, it's pretty trivial to sniff this traffic, pop it into Wireshark, and then extract the usernames and passwords, therefore bypassing all of your Cisco security policy. So Cisco, like I said, strongly recommends SSH be used instead of Telnet. There are some possible SSH issues, and they're not as prevalent as they used to be, so these are pretty much trivial now and might not exist in most cases. Some older equipment does not support SSH, like the uh, Cisco 2500 routers. If you're running 2500 routers, upgrade your fucking network. I don't know that this is specifically due to the router platform. I'm pretty sure that's an iOS bit, that they just don't make newer versions of iOS for 2500 routers. I think that most, if not all, modern iOS versions support SSH, but you can verify this when you download the iOS from Cisco.com by going to their feature navigator and checking to see that it supports SSH. Some terminal emulator applications do not support SSH. I don't think that's the case any longer. I know that TerraTurn Pro supports it, uh, Secure CRT, pretty sure Potty does. I don't use Potty a whole lot, but that's not such a big issue anymore. You might run into something with an older terminal emulator using SSH1 instead of SSH2 or something like that, but I don't think it's going to be that hard to find a terminal emulator that will support whichever SSH version you choose to use. Uh, because the router must encrypt and decrypt all SSH communications, remember this is getting encrypted, it's not going over the wire in plain text like Telnet does, it's going to use more CPU cycles. With modern router platforms, this is not going to be a big issue. It's probably not going to be an issue at all because there's far more CPU intensive protocols that will be taking your CPU cycle. So this most likely isn't going to be an issue. So like I said, the, there's these issues that are possible, but they're really not that prevalent anymore. There's really no good reason not to be running SSH in your network, uh, specifically with the security advantages it has over Telnet. Okay, so enough talking about SSH. Let's get down to nuts and bolts and configure this sucker. This slide is copied directly from the Cisco documentation. And it's funny because Cisco says, form the following tasks before configuring SSH but looking at these tasks these are the steps to configuring SSH so it's kind of weird but anyways the first one is to make sure that you have an iOS image that supports SSH. Uh, it goes through a bunch of garbage here. You can read that on your own. Basically, if you're questioning whether the iOS version that you're looking to use supports SSH or not, you can go through the feature navigator on Cisco.com to verify that. So then the actual configuration, configure a host name. Well, everything has a host name, whether it's, you know, router, the uh, out of the box host name or you've configured a host name so we've done that a billion times not a big deal the second part there is configuring a host domain for your router because SSH is going to use that combination of the host name and domain name so if your router is r1 and your domain name is packetlab.com it's going to use r1.packetlab.com and we'll see that in just a bit and the next step is the one that is going to be the most foreign to you and that's going to be generate an RSA key pair for your router. There's a pretty simple command to do that. We'll look at that on the CLI. It's going to automatically enable SSH once you do this. So really, the command that enables SSH is creating this RSA key. It'll enable it, but it won't freaking work until you do the other steps. So if you get an exam question that says, what command enables SSH on your router? Technically, this command does, and we'll look at it. It's the crypto key generator, crypto generate key. I can't remember the exact syntax. We'll see that in just a bit, but it'll enable it. And by enabling it means it'll enable the SSH server, but you're not going to have connectivity until you do these other steps. And since generating the key, enables SSH, it logically follows that deleting the RSA key is going to disable the SSH server. So this is something that I would keep an eye on just for, you know, exam slash trick questions because that command actually enables and disables the SSH server. Again, it's not going to work very well unless you have the other bits configured. And the last bit here is configure user authentication for local or remote access. As I touched on before, you're going to have to either use your AAA going to a radius server, TACX server, whichever you're running, or if you're using 
the local username database then you'll have to create those usernames and password combinations what you won't be able to do that you can do with Telnet is simply set up a VTY line password and use that for authentication you need to use a username and password combination with SSH